morning, afternoon, evening, depending on when you're actually watching this video. As I record, the afternoon sun is peeking through my dining room windows. Um, so I mentioned to Katie and to Mary how glad I am to be able to help you all in this time as we all seek to remain connected, to still have that sense of community, even when we're apart. Um, and I do feel the need to name, though, my own sadness in this, that I had a great part of why I enjoyed coming to Winston-Salem Friends and to, to speaking um, to you all is because I love being able to worship with you all. So it's a little strange recording this video and just seeing my own face staring back at me. Um, because I do miss being able to see your faces and to hear your beautiful voices and your encouraging words during open worship. So I hope you are all doing well, that you have all that you need during this time and that you still are able to connect with one another. Um, and I also warned Katie and Mary that Ava Gray might pop up and make an appearance during this video, but I quickly learned that Ava Gray doesn't like to just pop up and say hello and then wander off. She likes to be in the entirety of the video. So she is occupied at the moment. And I did make a deal with her that she can make her own separate video where she sings a song or of some sort. So depending on <laughs> how that turns out, I may also send a video of that as well to Katie so you all can see that. Um, but like I said, I, I hope you're doing well as can be during this time, that you're able to, to rest, to be, to enjoy the simplicity of this time and just discover a new way of connecting with one another. I am actually did a clearness committee last week and have another one today um, online through Zoom, which I was very nervous about at first, um, doing that sacred Quaker practice online, um, but was pleasantly surprised that even in through technology, and the spirit can still move when we are open and receptive to that presence. So my days have changed drastically as we all, as all of ours have, and as we all adjust to the many changes and the uncertainty um, of our days, where I used to spend my days in class and at the church and at the school. I now spend them in ninja training camp and building obstacle courses out of extra wood in the backyard and making fairy gardens. And y'all, I was shocked to discover how many dinosaurs live in my neighborhood. I mean, they are everywhere when you go on our daily walks with our dog. Who knew that dinosaurs and the occasional glitter monster were so abundant in Greensboro, North Carolina? I didn't know. But you will be glad to know that Ava Gray is always prepared. She is an excellent trail guide, and she always has her camouflage suit ready to go to hide from the dinosaurs, and even has an extra one for me. So consider it. So we are staying safe over here, and I am sure that if the dinosaurs migrate over to Winston-Salem, Ava Gray would be happy to send you a camouflage suit as well, too protect yourself in this time. So, <laughs> as we um, move into our time of worship together today, I wanted to start like we often do with a moment of centering. And I wanted to do that a little differently today. I wanted to begin our reflection with a song. And this song was one shared with me by a wonderful friend, colleague, and person at Wake Forest School of Divinity. And it's written and performed by a dear friend of hers who um, allowed me to, to share it with you all this morning. And it's 
inspired by the writings and the words of Julian of Norwich. So I invite us to pause, to listen to the words, um, and after the song ends, I'm going to allow us a few moments of quiet and reflection. And I'm also going to black out my camera so that you don't have to, to look at my face <laughs> and that we can more adequately allow the spirit to move us in the song and in the words and in the stillness. Amen. This Sunday is Palm Sunday. It's the start of, of our Holy Week. 
And it's the week we prepare to approach the cross, to approach Christ's horrific death by an oppressive system, and the reminder of God's presence in the midst of people, of God's continued presence in our everyday lives. So as I was thinking about what I wanted to share today and preparing for the sermon, I kept asking myself, what does Palm Sunday have to teach us? What does Christ's triumphant entrance into Jerusalem a week before his arrest, his torture, and his death have to tell us today? What do these words mean to a people watching this message on their computer screens in their separate homes, separated by miles, instead of sitting together and sharing in the spirit. And I I think that message of the cross is that very thing. It's that reminder that we are never alone. My sophomore year at NC State, I took an early American literature course. And at the time, I was purely a biology major. And so it was my one non-science, non-math course that semester. I loved that class. And until I had taken that class, I thought I hated English, to the chagrin of my high school English teachers and probably my mother. I thought I couldn't write a paper, I couldn't analyze a poem, I couldn't think critically about this passage. And But I remember sitting in a cafe on campus that sunny spring day, and I remember reading this book in front of me. And nine years later, I can't tell you what I was reading can't really tell you any of the authors that I read just off the top of my head or who my professor was, but I remember loving the class. And I remember that reading in particular because it talked about Quakers. And at 19, I was going, oh, hey, that's, that's me. I'm a Quaker. And what it said was that Quakers were unique those early American Quakers, that no matter how far apart they were, how separated they were, that they remained connected, that their faith bound them together, that those early Quakers, they embodied that message of Easter, this message of Holy Week, of the cross, of the story of the resurrection, that we are not alone. Our scripture today comes from Psalm 118, and I debated for a long time whether I was going to read this in its entirety or do snippets, Um, but I couldn't really decide what I wanted to leave out, so I'm going to share all of it with you all today. Um, And my translation is in RSV if you would like to follow, follow along. Psalm 118 states, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say his steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. With the Lord on my side, I do not fear. What can mortals do to me? The Lord is on my side to help me. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to put confidence in mortals. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. All nations surround me. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surround me, surround me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surround me like bees. They blaze like a fire of thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. 
The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has punished me severely, but he did not give me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. God's presence is an interesting thing. And I have spoken with you all before about the concept of thin places, about those places in which we are more receptive, more open to that all-consuming spirit. This psalmist, this poet of Psalm 118 is describing such an experience. It's describing an encounter with God. As Jewish mystic Martin Samuel Cohen describes it, the psalmist describes a portal through which representatives of terrestrial humanity may step towards the reality of God's presence and that more than a door, this portal is a kind of path down which the faithful may travel to the empirically verifiable, centrally perceptive, intellectually unimpeachable experience of God's nearness and God's willingness to communicate and of God's existence. Because God is present. In the uncertainty, in the fear, in the loneliness, God is still present. He is that triumphant king coming forward on the donkey to a welcoming crowd. He is the lonely man hanging on the cross. And she is the presence in the midst. God is within and around us. This poet names the complexities, names his sufferings that he has had to endure. Because God can handle our disgruntled complaints. That it's okay during this time to say, you know what? It's kind of really just stinks. Plain and simple. It's okay to lament what we have lost. Christ hanging on the cross said, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's okay to feel like, we're failing at this, whatever this is. And I read an article recently about the lie of productivity in this pandemic. As parents set up full Montessori schools in their kitchens, as those amazing, wonderful teachers attempt to still fully instruct and fully care for and attend to their students' needs, as parents try to play the role of teacher and still full-time working employee. And as people try to remain positive, 
during the loss of a job or of income, it's okay to lament. And this week, as we approach the cross, name your frustrations in this. Name what hurts. The psalmist does. And the psalmist doesn't stop there. In this encounter with God that we see here, they also name God's reminder that she is intricately connected to our lives. That we are connected to God, to one another, and to this world. Psalm 118 expresses the psalmist's declaration of the experience of knowing God and salvation in the context of his personal, real life. His physical existence is where he finds God. We are not able to worship together today. But God is still here. God still meets us where we are. John 12, 35 through 36 states, The light is with you for a little longer. Walk while you have the light, so that the darkness may not overtake you. If you walk in the darkness, you do not know where you are going. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become children of light. Christ utters these words in John before the Passover celebration, before the Last Supper, before his arrest, and before his crucifixion. But he knows what's coming. He knows what's ahead for him. And it's pain. But in this statement, he's offering hope. Hope in God. Light imagery that we see here in John is something as Quakers we are apt to use and to latch on to. And it's something of which I'm perpetually drawn to. In the light, we find our companion. We find our reality, the ultimate reality. God. God in us. God's presence in our lives. And that darkness where we can't see where we're going and we get lost. It's not the shadow. It's not that absence of light. But the silence. God is present. God's existence is known when we share. When we share our laments and our joys and our pain and our hope. I began our time of worship this morning with a song, a beautiful rendition of the words of Julian of Norwich. And I did this, or it was brought to my mind as I was preparing for today, because it's one I actually heard last semester, um, but I'm currently reading Revelations of Divine Love by Julian of Norwich for my comparative mysticism course. And if you haven't read it, please go do so. It's phenomenal. Um, I'm struck by her message. And her message that countered those dominant male voices of her time that preached this vengeful and judgmental God where she was surrounded by images of hell, she preaches an optimistic theology in which God is nothing but goodness. She presents a God of pity, of love and mercy, not blame. She shows a God of maternal love that bursts humanity through Christ and continually cares for and feeds its child. She reminds us that God safely protects us in both joy and sorrow equally. And he loves us as much in sorrow as in joy. All shall be well 
we shall be well. God shall grant us light, as it says in Psalm 118. When we doubt, when we struggle, when we lament, and when we are in pain, God grant us light. Let us speak that light into existence. Provide us hope. Give us healing. Remind us that we are not alone. That you never remove your loving hands from your work. And that we are bound one to another. That though we may be far apart, it is your spirit that connects us.